Today this is uh, macroeconomics lecture number nine. Uh, today my goal is fairly modest to uh, cover chapter four from Rothbard's Mystery of Banking, uh, supply of money. With supply of money also comes the topic of uh, inflation. So first of all, we have to try at some point to explain what is uh, chronic inflation. We already did a little bit of that before. What we said was that if there is a some sort of a supply shock, could be oil, could be as we just experienced uh, in late 2007 and early 2008, we had like a wheat shock, shock in the supply of wheat. You will have a one-time change of prices where prices adjust to the new supply and demand conditions. But because there is a one-time supply shock, you do not get an increase in the overall level of prices. This does not occur and this cannot occur. Sure, wheat prices would go up, but some other prices must necessarily go down. And the point that we made, I think, two lectures or three lectures ago was that the only possible way to have an ongoing inflation, and ongoing is sometimes called chronic inflation, sometimes called sustained inflation, and this is increasing prices over and over and over again. For example, prices rise 5%, let's say six years ago, and another 5% five years ago, and another maybe 6% four years ago, and prices keep rising and rising and rising steadily. We call this chronic or sustained inflation. So, it is hard or impossible to explain uh, rising or chronic inflation with demand for money. It is impossible to do that. The only possible explanation is with the supply of money. As simple as that. The only way to get chronic or sustained inflation is if the government keeps printing and printing and printing money. We'll get to see so uh, uh, fairly soon today uh, why they might do that. So. The question to answer, and that's, uh, let's take a look, that's pretty much the question uh, for section one is the optimal quantity of money, uh, optimal, we put in quotation marks. So what is the optimal quantity of money? You would constantly hear that the Federal Reserve's got to increase a little bit more uh, the money supply or they have to accelerate the money supply. Well, that was at least in the 60s and the 70s. Now, central bankers and economists don't even talk anymore about money supply. Now they talk about interest rates, saying that the Federal Reserve must lower interest rates and this will stimulate demand for money. In other words, money gets cheaper and people will be willing to borrow more. But nobody really discusses what is the optimal supply of money. And the optimal supply of money actually has a shockingly simple answer. Any amount of money will do the job. In other words, whether you have one billion in circulation, or 100 billion in circulation, or 1 trillion in circulation, or 10 trillion in circulation, no matter what the money supply is, once it is there and the key works as money, meaning functions as money, and the second key condition is we allow prices to adjust, any amount of money is by itself optimal, and prices will adjust to that supply of money. In other words, no matter what the supply is, the purchasing power will, will increase or decrease 
to that money supply. So that's on the optimal quantity of money. The question becomes next. Okay, do we get or benefit anything by increasing the money supply or possibly reducing the money supply? Somehow, uh, intuitively, everybody understands that we cannot really possibly benefit by shrinking the money supply. In other words, if we simply withdraw money from circulation, people intuitively understand that this cannot possibly be good. Again, their intuition is then wrong. Now, people also have the other intuition. If you could increase the money a little bit more, we're somehow going to get a little bit richer and we're somehow going to benefit from it. And it is a good thing to increase at least a little bit the money supply. Well, then becomes question number one. If it's good to increase a little bit the money supply, what, why not increase it a little bit more? And then, well, why not increasing a whole lot more? And then, well, why don't you just, just double everybody's money, you know, and, 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 and be done with it? So everyone is twice better off. The answer to this question is, again, very simple. Increasing the money supply does not provide any social benefits whatsoever. So, optimal quantity becomes any. Then we get to uh, money supply increasing. And here is the key word. The key word is social. No social benefits. Now, let's explain the key word social. What does it mean? It simply means that money functions as money, which means that money serves the social function of a medium of exchange. If you have only thousand units of money, thousand dollars or thousand lever, and everybody has it and the economy operates, thousand will serve as money by allowing exchanges between people. If you have one billion of money, the number and the quantity of exchanges will be identical. In other words, people, somebody has labor to provide, the other one has coke, and the third person has third thing. By the law of scarcity, you cannot just increase the whole output miraculously. Whatever the output is, it requires a certain amount of exchanges, and whether you have one billion or one trillion, or whatever, 10 million, the money will provide it. So, the money provides the social function of medium of exchange and its quantity, if increased, will certainly not provide any social benefits. That's extremely important to understand. So, let's move on to an example or illustration which is known in the economics literature as the uh, Angel Gabriel Gabriel model. The Angel Gabriel model is very simple. It simply does what I said a few minutes ago. Let's double everybody's money overnight while everyone is sleeping at one or two o'clock midnight after all bars and shops and everything is closed angel gabriel uh, really wants to do good to all people and he says i'm gonna make everybody twice richer so whatever your money is in the bank or in your wallet we will or he will angel gabriel will double the money supply is there any benefit to that? No. The answer is in general, no. But those who are really smart in the morning, they wake up and rush first and go and buy that whatever it is 
textbook at the low price, right? You're, you're eager to buy those textbooks, they're now very expensive, but if somebody doubles your money, you're gonna rush and possibly buy them because you get to feel the textbook to be for you guys twice cheaper effective. That's how uh, the thinking goes. But the problem is that uh, everybody gets to realize, oh, I got twice the money. So everybody gets to rush by lunchtime to do their shopping of whatever they want to do. So the ultimate result is prices will more or less double. And if prices will more or less double, everyone having twice the money and prices have gone up more or less twice on average. Well, some prices may go a little bit more, some less. Elasticity is a demand, I don't want to get into that. The point is that by doubling everybody's money, there is no real benefit. People didn't get twice richer. They have twice more paper bills in their pocket. The but the purchasing power didn't change for the simple reason that whatever is out there to purchase didn't change. So all the Cokes and Pepsis and everything else, whatever is produced and out there on the market, it didn't change. So whether you double the money supply or increase it 10 times or increase it million times for the total money supply, the overall purchasing power remains unchanged. It is still the same whatever is out there on the market for sale. So, Angel Gabriel unfortunately was not able to make people better off. But, there is a but. What happens to those guys that actually rush early in the morning seeing uh, that their money supply has doubled? They rush and they still enjoy twice the money they have at still the lower prices. So when this really happens is they'll realize that their purchasing power temporarily has increased until, and here is the trick, until all prices get to rise. So when do prices rise, more or less double? When people, majority of people get to rush in and purchase. So those that rushed in first or early they actually get to enjoy the lower prices and they actually get to enjoy the benefit. So the tricky part to understand is actually those that rush to spend first will benefit and those that rush to spend last or actually wait to spend last will actually lose. So it turns out that the Angel Gabriel model has no social benefit zero benefit for the whole society as a general but some groups we call them the early spenders will benefit at the expense of the late spenders we call this the redistribution of income uh, why do you think that late spenders will lose money from it? If the money supply is double, then the prices will double accordingly, but the people won't lose anything. Uh, the purchasing power of money will just decrease, but they will have twice as much money. The, 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 the answer, at least initially, is that uh, those that see the prices lower, they'll actually buy more. And when they actually buy more at the lower price, uh, again, you got to understand for a couple of hours, maybe up until lunchtime, there will be this balance, this balance. So that they will get to buy more of the stuff even if they don't need it, simply because they find it more valuable than the paper money. So they will, they will buy a little bit more and the prices for these guys at the higher prices, they will be facing even higher prices. So there will be a temporary redistribution where prices will a little bit more than double before they settle down. But the point is, if somebody was able to buy with his money a little bit more, it must necessarily be the case that somebody else must have uh, bought a little bit less. You see, see the logic? Quantity of goods is the same, not changed. All right, let's see what's... Yeah, from my question, 
question is, what if these early spenders will choose not to spend money but exchange them into dollars and euros, let's say? Like more stable currency. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> because that's what happened in Russia. In oh, all oh, right, right. Uh, okay, so, so, uh, all right, so, so what happens if, if they choose to, to convert it into what we call it a harder currency? So the, the answer is they will still preserve some of their purchasing power. That's why, at least back in the old days in Bulgaria, when those uh, credit millionaires, they borrow a million in Bulgarian leva, they immediately rush, convert their leva into dollars, and wait a couple of weeks or a couple of months that the lev has fallen in value due to inflation, the lev has devalued against the dollar, so they sell off some of their dollars and then they pay back the loan and essentially what they did is the same thing as what I was talking about is extract an inflation tax. Uh, let's try to think of it this way to clear up your thinking. Rather than borrow in Russian rubles and then convert it into dollars, I had the same idea, explained the same thing a little bit before. Someone seeing his money double, he rushes to convert it into harder goods like coffee, sugar, uh, wheat, again, gold. So essentially these harder commodities, essentially rather than rush to spend it, uh, they will actually rush to convert the more lever into goods. You see, so it is identically the same thing. And later on, they'll sell the good at the higher price. And when they sell the good at the higher price, they'll extract a pure profit. You see, so whether you think in terms of converting rubles into dollars or euro, you can think of converting rubles into wheat, which is as hard currency as dollars. Actually, a lot better because uh, dollars falling against wheat, right? If prices of wheat double, it's not that the prices of wheat doubled, it's that the then a dollar fell. Alright, so the Angel Gabriel model and what I've been explaining so far is one of the most fundamental concepts in monetary economics is that of an inflation <coughs> tax. If someone can print money or increase the money supply and that someone uses that new money to spend it, then the answer is that someone, in other words, the early spenders, whether they convert it into dollars or wheat, will be able to increase their wealth and the increase in the wealth due to the initial increase in the money supply is called an inflation tax. So the inflation tax uh, represents redistribution. It is a redistribution from late spenders to early spenders. So the inflation tax means that wealth from the late spenders uh, moves to early spenders. In other words, early spenders gain or benefit at the expense of late spenders. There has been no actual economic transaction. There was no voluntary transaction. The early spenders were able to extract it, and sometimes for inflation tax we call extract, and sometimes we call impose. In general, the word for taxes is to impose a tax. So, the idea is that in inflation tax, the early spenders impose an inflation tax on the late spenders, or they actually extract it from them. In other words, those people that are able to benefit, benefit first, and those people that get the money last actually lose. So that's the point number six in
the inflation process. Uh, suppose that, as it happened in the 1850s, well, 1848, gold rush in California, that tons of gold were discovered in California, therefore mined, and once they were mined, they started what we call rippling through the economy. The miners, those that actually discovered them, the prospectors, got the gold first. Well, what did they do with the gold? Well, they went in and bought land, they bought houses, they bought other things of value, horses, oxes, cows, etc. So these guys getting the money first, they spend it, but someone else, whoever had the horses or the oxes or whatever, farm animals, they will get the money and they will, again, use the money to buy wheat and corn and other, I don't know, some agricultural farm products. So the point is that once these guys mine the gold out of the ground, they are what we call rich or richer. They are able to spend it on, let's say, excuse me, real estate and uh, let's say uh, farm animals. Real estate guys and farm animal or animal farmers will use it on, let's say, agricultural commodities. And once the money starts flowing through the economy, it will first raise around in the area uh, the value of horses. Everybody's got a lot of gold, they're just digging it out of the ground, and there is a little bit of a shortage of horses. Well, there is no shortage. Yes, there is short uh, of horses became relatively scarce to gold. In other words, the supply of gold increased many times, but the supply of horses did not increase. So the result is when horses become relatively scarce, their price will go up in terms of gold. Well, some more horses will be coming from uh, you know, neighboring states, etc. So suddenly, horse prices will increase a little bit. And then wheat prices will increase. If horse prices uh, go up in value, uh, animal farmers will say, oh, let's breed more horses. So whatever the horse is eating, they're going to be buying these. So suddenly they will be following, or what the textbook is using, probably the best word is, it will begin to ripple through the economy. And again, here is the trick. Those that got the gold out of the ground first, will benefit the most. And those that are usually getting it as wage workers or laborers somewhere in some other state, they will see the prices of horses go up, but their wages did not go up. In other words, the purchasing power of their wages falls. Well, the loss of purchasing power of wages is the inflation tax that they actually paid. Now, that's one example. The other example I found that uh, students uh, do relate, at least here at AUBG, is, uh, again, for the inflation tax and, in general, the inflation process is, now we got this uh, super lab in the basement and we are able to get to print money, right? Increase the money supply. So, we're able to print, I don't know, a couple of million a day. So, uh, today we print a million, we give each student a thousand, right? And the guys go and rush and spend it. Well, tonight you're going to be buying beers, you're going to be all over town. Uh, if, if we just give everybody a thousand that we just printed up, what's going to be the result? The result is going to be by tonight some beer prices will go up, or whatever you guys consume. Suddenly we'll realize that you guys will rush to the bookstore. Everybody's got a thousand in his wallet. By tomorrow, the bookstore will be out of textbooks. The only way they can handle the situation is double or triple the prices of textbooks. So, what happens? Bookstores got more money. They'll get to spend it and buy some more textbooks. Those bar info owners, they made a lot of profits last night, all right? So, next evening, we you know, have printed in the meantime another million. Again, we give it to many of you. 
you get to buy some used cars, right? Suddenly, used car prices go up. Suddenly, used car salesmen get to profit out of it. So, what, what's next? Next is we print another million, we distribute it around, uh, let's say, this class, and suddenly each one of you's got, uh, let's say, $100,000. Suddenly, everyone see $100,000, We'll see a bunch of Ferraris and Lamborghinis, if that would be enough to buy them, right? Uh, in front of, you know, the, 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 the building. The point again is, suddenly, uh, luxury car makers will be making tons of money. The point is, we keep printing and does it seem like prosperity to you? The answer is, of course, to you it is prosperity. You were getting these millions, you were getting to spend them. It is prosperity for you, but ultimately what's going to happen is uh, prices of everything is going to rise. You know, soon you get to print these millions, you're going to be buying houses, you're going to be buying land, you're going to be buying everything. So before long, in just a few short weeks that we've printed a couple of billion and you guys were able to spend them because you know the more you wait, you know. The, the higher the prices will be, so the smart people will rush and spend them immediately. So, you get to drive prices higher and who's going to suffer? Who's going to pay for your uh, luxurious life because we were able to run the printing presses? And Other the, people who didn't get the money, uh, non-students. Yeah, non-students, for example, retirees. They were living on 100 Bulgarian level retirement or pension. Well, next month and next year, they're still going to get 100 pension. Their purchasing power will go down substantially. In other words, because there was an overall increase in prices, as the money rippled through the economy, some people got an awful lot of them, but other people, let's say a couple of hundred kilometers from here, they will not get an awful lot of them, or will get very little uh, from them. The answer will be, they will be losing purchasing power. So these people, again, will be paying that inflation tax. So the Angel Gabriel model, what it says is that, okay, there are no social benefits, but still, those that can print the money and can use them first will definitely benefit at the expense of those that get the money late or that don't get the money at all. All right, so that's one of the more important lessons on inflation. Let's see what else we have. Now, the important point to understand in general is that uh, when money supply increases, no social benefits is translated into a very different way. Just because we doubled the money supply, the number of workers did not increase. You gotta understand that. The quantity of capital did not increase, meaning the number of buildings did not increase, the number of stores did not increase, the number of professors did not go up. The uh, quantity of resources like electricity, like oil, like everything else did not change. In other words, when money supply goes up, uh, let's call them production factors or factors of uh, production, remain constant. So, the real things that create real value did not change. They remained the same. So, if this is really true, then it is true that there cannot be social benefits. It is true that it cannot benefit the whole economy as a general. Alright, so, let's see now, uh, counterfeiting. Counterfeiting is increasing the money supply by strictly illegal or fraudulent manner or 
you use some illegal way. Uh, my example was exactly what we did down there in, in the basement. We get a machine that will print money and that is counterfeiting. So counterfeiting is important to understand is that the result of counterfeiting is always an inflation tax. So counterfeiting always results in an inflation tax extracted by the counterfeiters themselves and then extracted by those surrounded by the counterfeiters. That was once the money supply gets to circulate, the counterfeiter will be able to benefit. But those related to him, in other words, whatever the counterfeiter spends it on, they'll also be able to benefit at a lesser degree. All right. Professor, what if they don't print that money? Okay, well, well they, if they don't pour they, they, or they, the government, the central bank, you mean the no, basement? The well, Again, okay. even if they print 100 lever or 100 dollars, they stand to gain and they stand to benefit. They stand to benefit, meaning they are able to extract a real resource, whether it's electricity, gasoline, a textbook. They were able to get a real resource without sacrificing anything. In other words, they did not work for it, they did not give up something else in value. So, if they are able to get something for nothing by the mere law of scarcity, it follows that something must have lost it. In other words, it's a pure loss to somebody else. Of course, the beauty with inflation is that if I'm able to print me a million or only hundred, I get to benefit, but I get to spread the pain amongst one million Bulgarians. So if I just print one million lever, and we have one million Bulgarians holding lever, the answer will be every Bulgarian will stand to lose one lever. So it appears as if there is no real loss, but the loss is borne by million people. Even though it's tiny, it accumulates. Uh, how this counterfeiting relates to the general assumption that individuals cannot affect the conditions of the market, the, you know, the prices. What, 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 what do you mean, guys? If we get to print, let's say, <laughs> uh, every day one million, so we give you a million and we give her a million and we give him a million, I bet that Ferraris and Lamborghinis prices will skyrocket in Bulgaria in just a few short days. Then you're going to get to buy those M5s and M3s or Porsches or whatever. The point is that if you get to print sufficiently enough money, you will affect some prices. Uh, that's, I mean, that's how it works. Uh, again, it is a, let's call it a working assumption in microeconomics that the person or individual cannot affect the overall price structure, but the point is exactly the opposite. If you have a central mechanism that infuses the money, and that central mechanism is called the government with the help or with the use of the central bank, whatever the government spends most in first will certainly affect the price structure. In other words, uh, you know, uh, government gets a lot of uh, gets a lot of government money. They spend it what? They spend it on Mercedes S Class, right? So suddenly we drive Mercedes S Class uh, in in whole Europe prices up because there's a shortage of them. Our government is buying into tens of thousands of them. Well, what if we do print a million and then we decide to keep it? Would the inflation have to be the interest that we accumulate on the money? Uh, well, e e well, if you keep it, well, how do you keep it? If you keep it under the mattress, <laughs> then it didn't no, really no. do anything. Yes, in, in the deposit. If you put it in the deposit, then the bank will get your money, will lend it out, and someone else will take it and spend it. You see, the minute you put it in the deposit, 
commercial banks don't keep your money in the deposit. They'll take it, they'll spend it right away, well, they'll credit, they'll give it as a loan, and someone else who gets the money will do that. Of course, it will take a little bit of time, uh, meaning uh, until they get it, until they you know, do the accounting, until they approve one million of loans. It may take a week, it may take a month, God knows. Then once the loan is approved, doesn't mean the guy who got the loan will take it the same day and spend it the same day. He may be building, let's say, a little uh, shop. He's gonna use, you know, a quarter of the money to build the shop, a quarter of the money for the machines, then a quarter of the money for inventory, and the spending may last three or six months until he has fully spent the borrowed money. And again, it's beginning to percolate through the economy. Any more questions? So what in this case would be the inflation tax? What is it? What in this case would be the inflation tax? The inflation tax will be that, say, Again, whatever the commercial bank lent the money on and whatever these people spend it, these people getting the money first or sooner will raise some prices. It could be bricks, it could be printers. So whatever they, uh, again, you guys don't, uh, don't see it because the price of the computer went from $900 to $902. So you see it as a negligible, and just because it's a negligible doesn't mean it does not exist. It is very simple. Someone was able to extract the pure value for it, and somebody else, maybe a million others, paid for it. But according to the definition, uh, in this case, the counterfeiter is going to gather this inflation tax, but what we see is that he doesn't. What, what do you mean he doesn't? Uh, if, he I doesn't print, if I print one million and, and I get to spend that million, I get it all. I get the pure value of one million. I mean, I get to buy a house, a car, and all the good stuff, the villa, you know, from last lecture. So all the good stuff that I want to get, I'll just get it. I get instead to benefit completely. All right, let's see what's next. Uh, inflation process, we covered this, injures. Uh, all right, so what is important to understand is that within the inflation process in general, and here is the key, whether it is perfectly legitimate or completely illegitimate by counterfeiting, in other words, whether the government sanctioned it and it was a true, genuine government monetary policy, or the evil deed of a counterfeiter doesn't matter. In either case, it hurts legitimate holders of money. So, if some people just have their money and they don't spend it, they just hold it for a while, I don't know, uh, maybe for three days, maybe for 30 days, the value, the purchasing power of their money will fall. So, not only it hurts those that don't get the money, but it also hurts people who have already the money and do not spend it in the period for which prices rise. So, legitimate holders of money. So, that's important to understand that the inflation tax is imposed effectively on all holders of money supply. All right, so let's see what else we have. Oh, okay, we have uh, section three of the textbook, government paper money. Uh, the problem, at least back in the old days, that uh, it wasn't easy to counterfeit gold. That's why people also chose it as money, because it was fairly easy to see. Uh, people had their own old ways to test it, whether the uh, coin was a little bit soft, you know, at least you've seen on movies how they try with their teeth to, to see if it's soft and all this kind of stuff. Uh, in general, gold is a little bit harder to counterfeit. Uh, kings have tried to put in some base metal in it and put in, let's say, 50% base metal, 50% gold. They put the gold on the top, but people always figure out how it works. So one of the ways for which the government has tried to effectively extract or impose this inflation tax is with paper money because 
paper is easy to print. So, how does the paper money work? Well, it works fairly simple. The first step in paper money is to say that a dollar is simply equal to one twentieth of an ounce of gold. So, on the first step, the government simply says the dollar is one twentieth of an ounce of gold. Then, on the second step, the government says that a paper dollar, and so I'm talking about the same dollar that when you go to work and travel, uh, that you're usually paid or used as change, that the paper dollar equals to simply a dollar, sometimes called a gold dollar. Gold dollar simply means that the dollar is backed by gold. So we have two words in here. Uh, number one is uh, backed. The other word is convertible. This means that whoever issues that gold dollar, in other words, it's a piece of paper, usually that one will be the government, sometimes it will be a commercial bank, sometimes it will be the central bank. In modern days, over the last 50 years, that would be almost exclusively done by central banks around the world, but back in the old days, a commercial bank would do that that the gold dollar is backed by gold or convertible to gold. This means that if you give one dollar, you will get one twentieth of an ounce of gold, which back in the old days worked more like you give twenty dollars and you get an ounce of gold for it. Is that the reason why the Bulgarian National Bank holds gold only? Actually, actually, that's not true. Bulgarian uh, National Bank holds mostly Euro. So, in our particular case, let's try uh, Paper Lab. Paper Lab is, we say, it is backed by Euro. Is backed by Euro. So, for every Bulgarian lev, there is half a euro. So the saying goes that for these 20 Bulgarian lev here, our central bank has and guarantees availability of 10 euro. The ratio is roughly 2 to 1, 1.95. So now let's try this. The introduce another word here. This euro here and this gold here, in other words, whatever backs the currency, no matter what, could be euro, could be Chinese yuan, could be dollars, could be gold, could be wheat, whatever that is, is called reserves. Reserve or reserves and is generally known as currency reserves. So currency reserve is the asset which the issuer of money, usually the central bank, keeps as backing the currency and for which the currency is convertible. For Bulgaria, according to law and at least custom and practice, the lev is backed by euro, so we say that euros represent for us the currency reserves. So, question: um, Are all euros in the in Europe uh, backed by gold in the European Central? No, they're not backed by gold. Again, uh, you guys are beginning to touch on the topic of world monetary systems, which I teach quite a few lectures in international finance which I'm trying at least to spare you from all the details of how different countries and what they keep in terms of monetary reserves. Again, that's not the topic. The topic here is that you guys simply understand because uh, on the midterm world the question will be 
what's a currency reserve? Okay, that will be a simple uh, question. We're not trying to ask, okay, what does China keep for currency reserve? What does the US keep for your, your currency reserve? So, uh, the European ECB is trying to have, for every euro, to have at least 20% of it backed by gold. All right? Uh, all right, so, uh, back to the paper dollar. Well, why or how would the government actually uh, get to make people use the paper bill if it has little or no value? It's worth, uh, well, the cost, production cost is roughly 20 to Tinky. And in well, the. Hmm? It has to stop using the gold. Well, okay, it has to stop using the gold, correctly. So, one of the ways to get, in general, uh, for a government to circulate paper money is it has a number of devices. The first device that a government uses is called convertibility. Uh, people prefer the gold, so they say, the dollar is as good as gold. At any point in time, you can walk in the bank or the central bank, and the central bank will convert your dollar to gold. So a lot of people say, okay, that's really good enough, but then they ask a second question. If it's as good as gold, why should I be actually using the paper money instead of gold, okay? I can still just stick to gold. So, the second reason that the government gives you is what? How's the textbook calling? Come on, guys, it's on, uh, let's see, page 38. It's called Legal Tender Laws. Oops, Tender. To tender means to give, to surrender. So, tender law means, legal tender law uh, simply means uh, that everybody must accept the currency as payment. So, in Bulgaria, if they are selling any goods, in Bulgaria, the Bulgarian lev is a legal tender, has a legal tender law behind it. This means that if they're selling food, the seller cannot reject the lever and may not ask for any other payment than lever. In other words, if you insist to pay in lever, by law he must comply and accept the lever. That's the meaning of a legal tender law, is a law which requires that sellers must accept the specifically given currency for, in return for their goods and services. That's what a legal tender law is. Uh, there are question, for example, in Bulgaria, if I go into a shop, I can buy something only with lever, right? Uh, you can buy what? I can buy a good with lever on it. Sure, that's what I do all day long. I, anywhere I go, I always pay with lever. I can buy something with euro. Oh, 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 oh wait, 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 wait a minute. Nobody says that the, this law outlaws any other currencies, and nobody says that this law makes other currencies illegal and crime. If you wish to pay with euro and the seller agrees to sell with euro, fine, no problem. Uh, same thing with dollars. If the university wants dollars and you agree to pay in dollars, fine, no problem. What this says is that if somebody offers the 20 lever, the other person must accept it. Chapel, I think there is a government policy that uh, if a um, uh, seller uh, will accept uh, like dollars, not rubles, they will be fined. Like well, again, <laughs> uh, legal tender law says the local currency is must be accepted. Now, there may be additional clauses which say some 
currencies are illegal. For example, you're the president Ahmadinejad, you know, of Iran. And you say, I hate the Americans. He says it openly everywhere on TV. He says, I will outlaw the American currency, the US dollar, in Iran and will punish everyone severely, whoever uses it. Sure, he can forbid or make illegal anything else that they want. But that's not the point. The point is not to make something else illegal. The point is to make the local currency acceptable. So that's the second way the government cheats, or well, not cheats, gets people to use it. Now, there is a third way uh, that the government uses, and this is uh, taxes. Payable in paper, meaning in the local paper currency. So, all right, guys. So, taxes payable in paper. Usually, governments everywhere in the world, since the world has ever existed, have had taxes. One of the better ways to support the local paper currency. Uh, these 20 is that the government not only requires taxes, but requires taxes to be paid with these paper bills. So, if I will have to pay my paper bills with paper bills, then I will have to sell some of my goods and services for these paper bills. So, by requiring that taxes are payable in the paper, the government creates demand for these paper bills, all right? So it creates demand, but could be artificial, we can call it real demand, but the point is you're a farmer, you produce certain goods and services, and the government says you gotta pay 10%, and when you're the farmer, you go to the market, and you cannot pay to the government with pigs or wheat, you have to sell some of your goods and it has to be for these pieces of paper, okay? So, this creates a built-in demand for the currency. And finally, there is the last one, the most important of them all. It has two different words in English. One of them is called trust, which is equivalent to confidence, confidence. No matter what kind of laws, no matter what kind of laws the government imposes, no matter how it requires taxes, no matter the type of convertibility, unless people get to trust these pieces of paper, they will not be able to circulate as proper money as real money. People will always choose or find something else. So who was mentioning Russia? Do you guys trust the Russian rubble? Whoever mentioned Russia here? Do you trust it? Oh, well, there you have it. So no matter that, let's say, Mr. Putin is the most powerful man in the world, now he is at this point, he can put any law on paper, he cannot make people trust and he cannot, you know, by law create confidence and if people don't trust it, the minute they get these rubbles, they convert them into oh, euros. euros, of course, <laughs> right, oh, oh, so, so, so here's an example of dollar, uh, dollar losing uh, its uh, value, I mean, the, 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 the best indicator in the world about uh, the currency of a currency, in other words, which currency is best for, uh, in general, as accepted, and it is considered that the top indicator is the black market. Which black market? No, the Russian black market. You got black markets in Colombia, you got black markets in every country in the world. <laughs> but the Russian black market is considered the indicator. So recently, a couple of months ago, there has been an article saying uh, Russian mafia losing confidence in US dollar, massively switching to euro. This spells 
trouble for the dollar. Turns out that Colombian mafia, meaning drug dealers and all, they also get to switch from dollars to euro. So you have to understand, this means that suddenly they, meaning the mafia, the gangsters, are losing confidence. Well, are they ahead of the population or behind the general population? They're always ahead, of course. They're always, they are the first one to feel the trends. They are in business for big money, so they can get to feel major losses when a currency falls. So once you know that the Russian and Colombian mafia is losing confidence in the dollar, you know that soon, well, sometimes within months, sometimes within a couple of years, major shifts are in the world monetary system, meaning shifts away from the dollar and into euro, but I don't really want to get into, uh, at least in this course. And then there is one last piece which governments like to use. We got, uh, how much time, guys? Is it seven, eight minutes? Seven minutes. Five minutes. Is called to demonetize, demonetize gold. So, anytime the government wants to have its paper money work as money, sooner or later, once they make it convertible to gold and legal tender or anything else, at some point, if they have to be truly successful, they must demonetize gold. Excuse me. To monetize means, oops, means to convert to money, to use as money. To demonetize means to withdraw as money, to stop using it as money. So demonetization of gold means to slowly but steadily make gold no longer used as money. What is the typical way? The typical way to do this is, number one, you just use a law. It is strictly against the law and anyone who's caught with gold shall be thrown in jail. Uh, a better way which seems to work uh, better, although it takes an awful longer time, is... No, propaganda. They simply tell, tell people that gold is bad, not good, losing value. Uh, people using gold are evil people. Well, I want to be evil, nothing wrong with that, you know. <laughs> all right, so uh, the point is they use all sorts of propaganda for which they get to convince, usually takes decades, never a year or two, it takes decades to convince people to stop using gold and that gold is not as good as money. The typical argument is, be smart. If you're using paper tickets, which we call money, you're going to get interest on it, all right? So gold is called a barren asset. What is barren in English? Forbidden. No, not forbidden. Means producing no offspring. Means produces nothing. Does not produce anything. So you have an ounce of gold. One year from now, or 1,000 years from now, you're still going to get an ounce of gold. Uh, what is not a barren asset? Well, a piece of land. It does grow, it does create something, it can get out of that land, all right? So gold is considered barren asset, and that is uh, sold by the government as a reason not to use gold at all. So gold demonetization. And now we get to the important question. Why would or should the government go through all of this trouble of providing legal tender laws, convertibility, making taxes payable, using decades of propaganda to get trust and confidence into the paper money and to demonetize gold? The answer is simple. To extract, to extract, Inflation tax. In other words, 
If you're the government, how can the government finance itself? So, question general. What are the typical sources for income for the government? What are the uh, government income? Taxes. Number one, taxes. You have to understand that people usually hate taxes. Back in the old days, they'll make a revolution because of taxes, right? So, taxes are relatively, at least back in the old days, relatively hard to raise. People resist them. And when taxes are relatively high, high people evade them. Bulgarians, we are really good at evading taxes and we learn from the Russians, right? <laughs> Russians are one of the best evaders. Well, they're at least notorious for that. So, taxes, how else? Percentage from government doesn't invest, come on, guys. Percentage from the accounts of in foreign banks. Well, yeah, that's not, that's what is this percentage? What foreign banks I mean? What keep reserves somewhere else? Some income. The second basic way is to income to produce. Like anyone else in the economy, we all get income for producing, creating something, delivering something for which somebody else is willing to pay. Uh, usually production is not uh, favored by governments. Governments don't produce, they don't bother to produce. Usually governments are not eager to get into the process of production and competing with the private sector because they're never sufficiently competitive. So usually this is Minimal. What else? How else? Another major method is expropriation. Uh, this is what happened to, uh, let's say, uh, in Venezuela a couple of months ago, as well as in uh, Russia. You had a Western oil company, uh, what you want, British Petroleum, I think, I don't know. And Mr. Putin says, sorry guys, it's now ours. They say, well, we made a couple of billion investments. They say, sorry, it's your loss, all right? So they just took something that was already produced, they expropriated it, and similarly was with Hugo Chavez a couple of months ago, so he expropriated some other uh, assets. So they can take that. Expropriation doesn't work. The minute you begin to expropriate and then foreigners say, Russia, no good for investment. So, soon people learn they don't, they don't invest in the country. And then there is that last way, is simply print and spend. So, the favorite way for governments to finance themselves is simply to print and spend. In other words, to impose or to extract an inflation tax. Let's see if there is any important point which I'm uh, missing. No, guys, it's Right on the minute, I'm done. Okay, question. Hold on, guys. How about felony punishments? A uh, what? No, punishment payments. What do you mean punishment payments? Like someone breaks the law and then... Oh, some penalty. Oh, they, they are minor. They are minor. <laughs> you get you, you get five dollars here and twenty dollars there. It doesn't really work the way it works. You print the billion here.